The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 107. Oi! Don't be scared. All of this is new to you and new can be scary. When people need help, I never refuse. There's this moment when you're sure you're about to die, and then you're born. I know exactly who I am. I'm the Doctor. Ta-da! Ooh. Should be fine. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing our appraisal of Season 11, the most recent season completed as of the beginning of 2019. And we're going to go back and look at the season as a whole. What do we think? Uh, what were the high points, low points? Uh, did they take our advice? And if not, why not? Uh, joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Great. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Uh, as always, folks, I want to remind you to like Doc- The Secrets of Doctor Who on Facebook and retweet us on Twitter. We have a Facebook account, uh, page, Secrets of Doctor Who. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at SQPN. You can leave us comments. Subscribe to the show if you have not yet subscribed in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or on YouTube, where you can hit the bell to get notifications when we post new episodes. And please, above all, share the podcast with your friends. Help us grow the community of listeners, and we can grow the conversation around one of our favorite shows, Doctor Who. So the the season of uh, this season of Doctor Who, this much anticipated season where so much has changed, uh, has just completed. Uh, we we will you know put that as official. I think the official season finale was uh, the Battle of um, Ranskor. Ranskor, I've call us. I've call us. It just drips from the t- off the off the tongue. Um, <laughs> but but uh, you know as all as usual the the holiday special because it's not it wasn't a christmas special uh really marks the end of the season especially since there's going to be a large gap to the next one we'll talk about that in a bit uh so we've got these uh, 11 uh, episodes is it 11 or 10 uh, 11 11 11 oh my rank i have a listing of the episodes and i'm missing one so i better go this back season on oh. doctor who they <laughs> turned it up to 11 <laughs> exactly <laughs> But one thing we did do at the, before the season began in episode 92 of The Secrets of Doctor Who, we talked about our advice for new showrunner Chris Chibnall. What should he do? What should he avoid when doing the season? And so uh, we, we wanted to start off by revisiting our advice and see whether mm-hmm. he uh, took that advice. Um, and one of the first things we said at the time was, How should he deal with the doctor being a woman? You know, should he spend his time emphasizing, uh, you know, the difference between being a man and a woman? Um, You know, uh, how should be treated, that sort of stuff. So what do you think? Um, Father Corey, let's start with you. What did you think about the way they handled that? I think they handled it about as well as they could. I think they really did. It was not... A major season arc issue. It wasn't something that was brought up in every episode. It was brought up, frankly, and in my opinion, at least, it was brought up at times when it was fitting. Okay. You know, kind of like that line where you know the the first episode where the doctor has just crashed through the the uh, the top of the train, the the roof of the train, and she goes, "Well, why are you calling me, ma'am?" Because you're a woman. Oh, that's right. I was I was a man just a few you know hours ago. <laughs> right, an right. old man a few hours ago. You know, I you know I, I think they I think they handled it very well because they didn't make it a major issue in my opinion. You had said uh, in the in that episode that uh, they shouldn't spend all their time you know combating the the bad historical treatment of women. Um, it came up. A couple times, right? Uh, but yeah, and that's you, fair. Yeah, and and how do you feel they they did with that? Um, admittedly, one of my least favorite episodes <laughs> kind of dealt with some of that. Yeah. Um, but I again, I, I I think as a whole, they they didn't quite they did better in some aspects of playing historical figures. Okay. But I think they did worse in a couple others as well. Okay. And Jimmy, in your uh, assessment, you said um, 
you don't be I am woman hear me roar and I mm-hmm. think that's pretty pretty close uh, and yeah. and that you said that she should follow uh, Patrick Troughton's uh, example um, yeah how do you think I I think in terms now I I, I think they could have done better with Jodie Foster and the way they wrote her. And we'll Whitaker. talk about that. Oh, Jodie Whittaker, sorry. <laughs> um, when, um, uh, sorry, I just had some fava beans. <laughs> yeah, um, <sorry. laughs> no, um, I didn't, but the, um, I think they could have done better with some of the way they wrote Jodie Whittaker. And, and we'll talk about that when we get to the character of the doctor herself, I guess. But in terms of my advice for Chris Chibnall last time of, she needs to be likable. That's mm-hmm. job number one. She needs to be likable. And they succeeded in that. Jodie Whittaker's doctor is very likable. I like her a lot. She's she's a nice person. She does remind me up to a point of Patrick Troughton and Peter Davison, who were the two most likable, not necessarily the most charismatic, because mm-hmm. that probably would have to go to Tom Baker. But in terms of likability, they were the two most likable of the original series doctors. And I think Jodie Whittaker is in that same mold, which is what she needed to be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, w- one of the things we said was she needed to contrast with Peter Capaldi's sternness, his attack eyebrows, that whole that yeah. whole thing. And, and that it's... horrible rainbow coat he was always wearing. <laughs> right. Oh, wait, that was a different unlikable doctor. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, so it, it certainly is that a a a large contrast with Capaldi. So that, that Mm -hmm. certainly he did. They did do that. Father Corey, you said um, in in connection with this to, that they shouldn't get preachy, but they should entertain us. Um, You know, preachy about the doctor being a woman, I think is right. And then that, that I definitely think they did not do. There are other issues we'll talk about later that they got preachy about, but I don't think as far again as far as the doctor's character is concerned, I think they nailed it pretty well. Okay. I think they got exactly what they needed. You know, I I, I kind of you know uh, agree with 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 Jimmy. You know, they need to bring more humor into the character, and they definitely did. Right. You know, she definitely there's a humor there. They toned down the ego a lot. Yes. Yeah, that was very. That refreshing. was the biggest issue. We don't have. The, you know, David Tennant, I am the oncoming storm. I am the fear of all Daleks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't have that. Yeah. They didn't have the, the, oh, she knew everything that was going on. In fact, she was very clear when she didn't know what was going on. Right. And I think that was, that was part of the reason why she's more endearing because there's that vulnerability of being able to having to say, I don't have a clue. Let's find out. Right. Also, in terms of toning down the ego, this is the most egalitarian time we've ever had on the TARDIS, with the possible exception of Peter Davison's era, where, you know, they're not presented as his assistants or companions or her assistants or companions. They're characterized now as friends, and they've even pointed out the more uh, horizontal structure mm-hmm. rather than a hierarchical structure in the group on the TARDIS. That's right. Uh, one of the things, Father Corey, you said was uh, don't don't be too serious. Keep it light and fun. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what, I, I, I would say there were moments where it was serious, but there was yeah. some, there was some lightheartedness, a lot of lightheartedness. Oh, so, you know, I think one of my favorite episodes is one that was very lighthearted and fun. Kablam. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it I was agree. that was a very lighthearted, fun episode. It had its serious moments, but yeah. it was fun. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Jimmy, you, now you said for the doctor's personality, um, have a sense of adventure, be fun, be funny, have mm-hmm. wonder at it all. D- mm-hmm. d- what do you think d- 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 about the doctor's personality as a kid? I, I think they paid off on all of those qualities. I do think there's a missing quality, which we can talk about. But on those ones, I think they absolutely paid it off. So what was the missing quality uh, then? Mystery. Um, the doctor is, if you think about Jodie Whittaker's doctor, in my view, she's likable and that's about it. Um, there's not this element of mystery that prior doctors have had. Uh, when, I mean, you think back to the very first doctor, he's a man of mystery. We don't know much about him. Mm -hmm. Even in Patrick Troughton's time, he's outwardly likable, but he's doing this Columbo thing where he's using uh, his his likability to get people to underestimate him. And he's always got something cooking 
in his brain that you, the viewer, don't know what it is. So there's an element of mystery. Um, Peter Davison, he wasn't as mysterious. He was somewhat, <clears throat> but he was emotionally vulnerable at times, and he could have mood swings where he could he could get very angry and then very almost, you know, not crying, but close to that. He could be very emotionally vulnerable. And in Jodie Whittaker's case, she's she comes across, unfortunately, to me as pretty one note. She's likable. She's a little zany. Yeah. And that's about it. I don't mm -hmm. get a lot of sense of mystery or you know, what's cooking inside of her. I don't I don't have a sense of, you know, the wheels are constantly grinding and there's more to her that I don't get these hints of something more. I get a sense of this is who she is and that's about all there is to her. I saw someone say that the doctor has always been a bit of a benign psychopath in the sense of not an <laughs> evil psychopath, but but it, but in the sense of a little uh, a force of nature, unpredictable quite alien i mean even the best mm -hmm. even the most likable doctors like tom baker there was aspects of the personality that sometimes they would suddenly do something that was like that's kind of concerning like there was just an mm -hmm. aspect they would yep. they would either dismiss somebody or they would just be be kind of almost cruel um yeah. but 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 you like this this mystery that you're talking about jimmy and and you're right there is none of that in this this story. The, the, this particular person said the doctor wants a hug and want and is more kid friendly <laughs> that's kind of kind of how they, <laughs> they they phrased it fortunately i think this is something they can course correct on just like when peter capaldi had his very problematic first season they course corrected to make him more likable over the next two, I think they can add mystery to the doctor, mm -hmm. for example, by exploring, you know, that they dropped a mystery early on, which was, you know, the abandoned child. Yeah. Right. And and then they completely did nothing with that for the rest of the season. So I assume that's some kind of multi-season arc they're setting up. But hopefully, as they start to explore that, we'll get more of a sense of mystery back from right. the doctor. I think there, I, you could argue there have been a couple hints about when she talked about her grandma's. And then she talked about a dad. What's what? I, if I don't, what was it in resolution? She said something about she's um, she's heard that dads can be a problem. Right, right, right. That that may or may not be just coincidence or, or 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 not. But one of the things that you know I think that they could do is just expand the emotional range. And I think we saw yeah. a little bit of that in resolution when where confronted with the Dalek, mm -hmm. there was yes. a bit more of the of that of that range in her. But there needs to be a a wider emotional range from the Doctor. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So uh, it, one of the things we, we kind of, it, it, this wasn't, I don't think it came up in that episode, but it's sort of related and I can bring it in this point is, was this the biggest change in Doctor Who ever? You know, perhaps bigger than even in, the first time we had a regeneration? The, in terms of the character of the Doctor? Yes. Or well, in terms it, of the show as a whole? In the show as a whole. This this switch from uh, all men to, the, to Jodie Whittaker. Um, the, this change, the, the change of the doctor, was this the, to a woman, was this the biggest thing to, it, the biggest change in Doctor Who history to change the show more than anything else? I, I don't think that in particular was, because again, we've already established, it already been established long before this, that Time Lords can change gender during their regeneration. They'd already established that. Okay, fine. Um, I think I would say that this season is only because it was like a complete and total cut from what came before. Right. Change of showrunner, change of TARDIS, change of doctor, change of companions. There really, until we got to resolution, there really wasn't any connection to Doctor Who before, except the TARDIS and the doctor. Right. Everything else was kind of a new Wait, even there, even the the uh, you know like the CGI company, the company that did all the 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 special effects, that was a change. I mean, they changed just about everything other than broadcasting on BBC. Right, right. I mean, they would they didn't even really spend all that much time in London. I mean, a lot a lot of it was set in Yorkshire and in Sheffield in particular. Yeah. I mean, the setting was was different. Uh, I mean, there so, was there was a big change when they moved from uh, Davies to Moffat. They changed Doctor, they changed Companions, they changed TARDIS too, mm -hmm. but it didn't seem as big of a shift as this was because I right. think Chris Chibnall came out and said, we're, we're, we're almost rebooting the series for new fans. 
Well, and it's in there's the sense, too, with uh, in my opinion, with with Moffat, that he was kind of a part of the team already, because by the time he was brought on, he had already written a, a number of episodes. Well, Chibnall did, too. Uh, did so, Chibnall? No, that's right. He wrote two yeah. or three. I can't remember, but it wasn't quite the same. Yeah, he, we we actually talked about the other Doctor Who. He wrote. Uh, dinosaurs on a spaceship. If you oh, recall. that's right. That's I right. know you have blocked it. That's, I forgot that. You know, you, you <laughs> tend to suppress bad memories. <laughs> he, he, he wrote episodes; they just weren't memorable ones, right? But um, I, I, I don't think this is close to being a pivotal moment in the way that uh, there have really been two pivotal moments in the show's history. The first was in 1966 when we had the first regeneration, mm-hmm. and that opened up everything you know, compared to what had come before. And the second was in 2005 when the show came back and was very much something that felt like modern television. It was, Mm -hmm. that was, those were the two big moments um, in in the show's history. This is a notable shift, but it's really more like the shift from, uh, to Moffat from, um, um, from Davies. Davies. From Davies, and it's more like that. It's a recalibration, but it's mm-hmm. not an epical shift like 1966 or 2005. Okay, yeah, because I had seen a lot of uh, fans online kind of talking about it in those terms. But you're right; it just doesn't feel th- that big uh, to compare to those two. You know, so I, I mentioned that they they kind of approached it sort of as a reboot, and that was one of our bits of advice. Or was we talked about the balance between making the show accessible to new fans, which they've made as a priority versus mm-hmm. serving the old fans. Um, Jimmy, you okay would, with that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You said uh, we should have all new monsters, except we should bring back a classic monster during the season finale, which is essentially what they did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so good call on that. They took your advice. And, um, but that there should be references on the dialogue level throughout the, the season to classic things to make that connection. Yeah, did, did they do that? Uh, I'm trying to remember if they did that. Yeah, they had much. they referenced unit. They referenced right. uh, actually. I, I I don't remember the specifics at the moment, but I remember commenting on the podcast previously about oh, right out of the gate, they dropped several references to classic things in Who that I didn't expect them to that soon. Right, right. I think in Woman Who Fell to Earth, there was a couple uh, there. Mm-hmm. Um, Father Corey, you said to that they should look to 2005, the re, the relaunch to how they did right. it, which was basic setup just to get us into the story and then wait a bit to bring in the classic who monsters and other mm-hmm. references. Um, do, do you feel like they, they did that well? Uh, oh yeah. Very, I, I think they really did. Um, you know, and I, and part of it helped with the standalone episodes and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about, you know, for the general impressions of the season is I liked is that they had the standalone episodes so they didn't have to worry about trailing things along as they went, but they could develop over the course of the season. But, you know, of course, the fact is we didn't see a classic Doctor Who villain until the New Year's Day episode. Right. You know, with the Daleks. And and we've talked before ad nauseum about the fact that there is that contract with the Terry Nation estate, et cetera, et cetera. So it's understandable why the Daleks were the ones that came back. But they did a good job of just developing the stories or developing the, the basic Doctor Who mythos within the season. Yeah. You know, and again, they did do some callbacks. They did do pullback a little bit. They did, you know, there were the name drops by by the Doctor, some of which we've seen and some of which we haven't. And, you know, so, I mean, there there was that. But um, I think they did a good job of getting it established. Now, it'll be interesting to see for the coming seasons how they go from there with bringing in more of the classic stuff again. Because we talked about like what villains and monsters from New Who do we want to see? What classic Who monsters should come back reimagined, or or that have not come back into in the in the, in the two thousand five uh, re, re, um, reboot uh, we haven't mm-hmm. seen yet. And one of the things that I think you both said was is you know we don't really you're not really looking for more stuff to come back. We're kind of tired of you know Daleks, and Cybermen, and even mm-hmm. the Weeping Angels and. Uh, unless you have something new, don't bother. Exactly. I mean, unless you have something new to do with the classic monsters, don't bother because we've seen the popular right. monsters done repeatedly. Which well, it's, it's which kind of we funny did to get. look back. Oh yeah, yeah it's kind of funny to look back. We kind of did. Yeah, it was kind of funny to look back at the classic, classic who, and there are certain you know Daleks and Cybermen. Well, there were points in the history of the series where they didn't show up for years. 
You know, right. there was full seasons that had no Daleks, no Cybermen. Mm-hmm. And then there was a movement at one point to kind of bring them back. Right. But they still weren't like every, every year you had a Dalek episode. Every year you had a Cybermen episode like it is now. Right. Right. I mean, and, and we talked about it, and that these things can still come back. But for this first season, it was good to kind of stretch your legs a bit, you know, mm-hmm. and, and and I like the fact that we didn't see the Dalek. We we kind of were hoping to, you know, that maybe the last episode would be it builds up to it, re-energizes that expectation. What can they do? What will be new? How right. will they make it different? And that so a little bit went a long way <laughs> in that. Um, I we talked about uh, Father Query. You'd like to see maybe see the Ronnie again. Uh, Jimmy, mm-hmm. you said you'd like to see the Master and and specifically Missy or River Song or the Meddling Monk. Um, and mm-hmm. I agreed. I'd like to see more Time Lords and Gallifreyans. In fact, I'd like to see more about Gallifrey in general. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. Although the yeah. the bits we got at the end not, of Capaldi were a bit. Yeah, I, I understand not bringing any of those back this season. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it makes sense to bring them back in further yep. seasons. Um, so we talked about the story arc uh, stuff. And uh, Jimmy, you, you wanted to bring back big season long stories like trial of the time Lords was a season long story. We had others. Not a good one, but yes. Yeah. But we had other (laughs) classic who season long stories. Um, Father, Father Corey, you were more about keep the overarching arc like we'd seen in new who, uh, but not, but have some standalone stuff so that not every story is advancing the arc. Um, So that's closer to what we got. In fact, we didn't have any arc really at all. uh, Other than than the characters. Yeah, a few characters like yeah, especially uh, Tim Shaw. Uh, yeah. So well, but I'm in in terms of the. I mean, you're right. We did get Tim Shaw twice, but then um, we also got character arcs. So there's mm-hmm. character development among the TARDIS crew from mm-hmm. episode one right. to episode eleven. Well, um, and I would I'd argue that uh, you know if there is an overarching uh, storyline, we we kind of talked about this before. It's family. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got, you know, Ryan and Graham and Aaron, you know, R- Ryan's dad. You've got Yaz and her family. And then you've got all the companions and the doctor and the, you know, family. The, the family structures that develop there. Yeah. The problem here, though, I think is that even the companion story arcs rang largely flat to me. Mm. Um, so Yaz is, we get a little interaction with her family, but she doesn't develop as a character after episode no. one. Right. Um, the, I mean, they all develop in episode one because they're in this new world, all of them, even the doctor. Um, mm-hmm. but after episode one, Yaz doesn't change at all. The doctor does not change at all. She's in the same place she was at the beginning of the, of the season. Once she settled down after regeneration, um, the only two who do develop are um, Ryan and Graham. And the problem there is that until the until the New Year's special, even the Ryan Graham relationship is developed in a superficial way. Mm-hmm. Um, they do. I mean, we have this alienation between them at the beginning with Graham reaching out to Ryan and Ryan rebuffing him. And by the end, he is calling him Graham, Graham granddad. He is He's accepted him as family and so forth. And that's great. But look at how they do it. They have nothing but rebuffs or silence on that subject all the way until like the last two episodes. Mm -hmm. And then in the in in episode number nine, um, Graham does something that wins Ryan's confidence. He, He refuses to stay behind in the the underdown or whatever, the parallel world, you know, Mm -hmm. with the talking frog, he refuses to stay there in order to help Ryan. But Ryan doesn't even see him do that. He's just told about it. And he's even told about it off camera. We never see Yaz telling him about what Graham did. So Mm -hmm. just on, on a narrative level, in terms of what we've seen, Ryan just out of the blue in a line of dialogue in one scene with it's without any dramatization of this, it decides to accept Graham um, Mm -hmm. because he didn't see what Graham did. And we didn't even see the conversation where he learned about what Graham did. Uh, Then in the next episode, in episode 10, 
he's even he's even been more accepting of Graham. But again, it's handled very superficially. We don't get significant character exploration of Ryan's arc, really. I mean, we we have it, but it's kind of this paint by numbers thing done at the last minute. We don't get an on screen exploration of Ryan's uh, arc until we really meet his father in the New Year's mm-hmm. special. So I think even the uh, even the character dynamic, which is what Chris Chibnall is supposed to be famous for, was pretty paint by numbers until the very end. Right. Right. Okay. Um. Yep. It, it, I. There's more to say. We can. We're going to come back to talk about the companions uh, in mm-hmm. a total. But uh, well, let's go. Let, let's continue on through the advice we gave. We talked about what new time periods and places the doctor should go to, and uh, you, you know, we said go beyond the places you've usually gone. Go beyond medieval Europe, further back. Mm-hmm. Uh, go to other continents. Um, and and I feel like we got some of that. We got India. Yep. And we got mm-hmm. um, uh, 1950s America, which, you know, the South, uh, however we feel they did, they did uh, have a job of portraying it. But they but they, they went to these there. places, but they, they did go. There, yeah. Um, every the other ones were pretty paint by numbers still. Um, Ghost Monument, you know, so Women Who Fell to Earth, Arachnids in the UK, uh, um, were run of the mill. They got. Modern they got us England. out of London, though. They did. They did. Um, it takes you away. Took us to took us to Norway, which was mm-hmm. uh, a yeah. different. Um, then we we had a few space one set in space, and then we had um, one set in the you know medieval uh, England, or actually not later than that, but but uh, more than two hundred years ago in England. I think mm-hmm. I have to give him credit on these because, I mean, there's always going to be a mix of past and future um, right. and present. There's We're always going to have the three time periods. We had become overly 21st century London centric. Mm-hmm. And even though we didn't abandon the 21st century, we did get out of London. So I got to give him points for that. Yes. A little, little different scenery, if nothing else. Right. I still would like to see them go. Like I'm, I'm, I very much liked them going to India. Uh, yeah. I would like to see them go even further afield to Africa, to China, to, you know, M- you know, Ming mm-hmm. Dynasty China was one place I said specifically to, to, to more different places and times. Mm, you, should, yeah. you should watch Marco Polo, the first Doctor serial. That was awesome. I know. I wish it was available. Yeah, I would love yeah. to. I would <laughs> yeah. love to watch that. Uh, yeah. the, the one of the last episodes. You know, one thing I will will say, though, you know, at least as far as coming to current time that in classic who that that wasn't exactly uncommon either. Although there's the whole unit timing controversy. Yeah, it was fandom. effectively present day, but it was, you know, they were coming to present day. Matter of fact, the doctor spent a whole season stuck in present day. So, mm-hmm. right. I mean, it's not exactly an uh, uh, uncommon thing in the history of Doctor Who. So, I mean, that as far as it's concerned it is not a concern. But, yeah, the fact that they got out of London, at least, is a big improvement. Right, right, right. It's like, it would be like if it was always in New York City or something like that. Uh, so what are, the next bit of advice we had concerned set design, production design, and specifically we talked about the TARDIS. And I think uh, this is one where we all agree they did not take our advice. No. We said, get away from the junk room TARDIS, which I suppose they did. Um, uh, the console still had a bit of the junk room. Oh, you're right. Look. You're right. It did. It did. Yeah. Um, and avoid like darkness. And they totally went dark uh, on that. <laughs> it went even more dark than before. Though yeah. I, I, I still want that glowing spinning TARDIS as a little thing I can have on my desk and push <laughs> and it'll play the dematerialization sound. Yeah. Come on, BBC. <laughs> this is something I will buy. Give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's not that expensive to make. <laughs> Think Geek. Keep watching thinkgeek.com. They'll, they should I know, have it. I know. It'll come eventually. No, it's, that that was one of my biggest critiques is it's like, why can't the TARDIS be bright? You know, it's right. the, the classic TARDIS console or console room was always bright. There was always lots of light. It was much more comfortable than well, this dark cave than what they have now. This is, which is even more cave like with the giant carrot crystals whose tops yeah. bend up and down ridiculously. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was the worst. <laughs> I, I mean, I try not to be too critical on this show, but oh my gosh, when I saw those things bo- popping up and down, I'm like, oh, come on. That yeah, just it was, looked terrible. It, it was bad enough that the, you know, the, the center 
center of the console was just just dying crystal going up and down. It's like okay, and yeah, and you see the top <laughs> going bobbing. It's like who thought <laughs> yeah. that was a good idea. Um, yeah, I, I agree. With that. You know what? The, the, it's although I have to say, part of it is that this is the sci-fi aesthetic of the moment. Is the dark, like mm-hmm. dark ships. You know, Star Trek Discovery is does it. The Expanse is like that. A lot of these uh, shows, the spaceships are just dark inside, and I don't know what that yeah. is. You know, you go back to like Star Wars, and well, they had a distinct. The rebel ships had, were white interior and bright, and the bad guy ships were dark and gray inside and monochromatic. You know, it was it was interesting. I, I saw just watched a YouTube video last night. We're talking about the Orville. Yeah, and one point he made is. It looks like a Star Trek, sh- a classic Star Trek ship because it's bright. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he says, you know, the re- one of the reasons why the original Enterprise was white and bright colors is because of the limitations on the camera and television equipment at the time. You needed it to be bright if you want people to see detail. Right. You know, and of course, we don't have those limitations now, but you still have the same problem. You make them dark. You can't see detail. Yes. If you have the perfect audio file set up for a home theater where it gets almost to pitch black and right. you have the perfect projector that shows the, you know, 0.01% of black different from 0.0% of black, then yes, you will see every detail that they show. Most of us have pretty basic living rooms with outside light. Our TVs are nice TVs, but they don't have that kind of gra- video reproduction it's just going to look black and muddy. And right. that's what happens here. Or you're watching on your phone or your computer. Exactly. Right. You it, don't have, you know, I, I wish, I wish they would, you know, it's one thing again for a movie where you're in a darkened theater and everything and they have the perfect environment for it. But when you're watching at home, I wish these TV producers would recognize that the vast majority of people watching that show will not see every detail you put into it. Right. Well, the other thing that they did was that they we got the the control room and that's it. And that's we had yeah. talked about in Classic Who. You saw more of the TARDIS, more rooms, and not, even in New Who, right? But no, even I mean, but, I, I don't mind them not showing us more than the control room in the first season. Eventually, we'll want to see more, but right, that's but okay with me. Even in New Who, we saw we, we've seen some more corridors and other things, but yeah, we, we basically got this dark. And and to your point, Father Corey, I think the dark is a feature, not a bug, in the sense of they want to. Uh, uh, it's easier on the soundstage. <laughs> they don't have to worry yeah. about photographing uh, the wrong things. Uh, well, and it looks it looked like one of the walls. The walls that basically was behind the console. There was nothing there. Yeah, it was I mean, just it was just dark, black. Yeah, you know. So I agree. I guess I agree. maybe that's what they designed it to do. So the other thing we uh, we talked about was uh, the casting for guest casting. Uh, we we agreed we didn't want to really see stunt casting, which I don't think we really did. I mean, the, not we, a lot. There were a couple apparently, of apparently the guy who played the Trump clone. Well, yes, somebody yeah, Chris, Chris Roth. Yeah, he he was he's he's fair, oh, fairly well known. Chris and the king, the guy who played King James, was also apparently someone famous. Yes. That's true. Yeah, famous in Britain for uh for for his uh his acting, and uh, the also the woman in Kerblam was uh known. In fact, she was also in Broadchurch. But uh, so there was. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the season three victim, and I liked her much better when she was working for Kerblam. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, that's true. Um, so there there was a bit of. Um, we call it stunt casting, but there were a few famous people we didn't get to see, as as Father Corey, you said, you'd love to see, you know, Ian Chesterton, Susan come back, some of the mm-hmm. people from Classic Who. That would be nice to see some of these people, especially given their ages and the, you know, yeah. the limited time left that we have to, to bring some of these folks back uh, would be nice to see. But there's plenty of time. This is just the first season, um, and it's understandable why they wouldn't do that. Um, as far as the companions, we'll talk about the companions in particular in a bit. Uh, but oh, let's talk about the, like the companions in general. We talked about keeping the companions on the TARDIS. They should, you know, as in living there with the Doctor, and no more Doctor is my girlfriend. I I think we got that, didn't we? Probably I think you pretty much nailed it. I mean, they, yeah, they showed Graham's house a couple of times. They including squishing his. She rocking chair. <laughs> yes. That was I love that. Um, they showed Yaz's house. 
Um, I don't think we really got a sense of are they living than, on the TARDIS or not. But well, they, they were traveling. They, I mean, they were traveling quite a bit. So right. It, yeah. We didn't get the sense that they had left the TARDIS either. No. So I think they. I think they kind of split that one down the middle in the in a way that worked. We right. Yeah. We got a, a shift from the Clara dynamic of I'm living my life and I occasionally go on an adventure. Mm-hmm. This is this is feels much more like what we previously had on the series. And uh, and definitely no doctor boyfriend girlfriend thing going on. Right. Actually, I was I was kind of surprised. Um, not just that there wasn't the the doctor is my girlfriend, but they really started hinting about Yaz and Ryan early on, and then just dropped it. That was yeah. surprising. Yeah. First they, first episode or two, there was something where you could see they're trying to develop it, and then it just disappeared. So. I, and I would view that as a mistake because they need to find ways to tie Yaz more in, and yeah, that would right. do it if she if she and and Ryan become a thing. That's that's true. I I, I like what we see of Yaz. We just don't get enough of her, uh, and no. that's that's a that's a downside. Uh, that now, I'm kind of stepping on what we're going to talk about a, little, a bit later. But without talking about the characters specifically, one thing that a lot of people have said is three companions is just too many. It's splitting the time up. And so you don't have a chance to focus on the individual characters and give them their own personalities. I don't think that's true. If you go back, I mean, this TARDIS started with three companions and oh. they, it, you flipped the roles around a little bit, but it was basically what we have now with Ian and Barbara and Susan and the doctor. Right. And going back and watching those early episodes, I I get a strong sense of the personalities and the relationships and the contributions of each of the three companions. Oh, yeah. In addition to the doctor, I think you can write a, a four hander for this mm-hmm. for the core cast of this show, and I think it's been done successfully before. I think three or four people is is the the sweet spot. Any more, mm-hmm. it's too crowded. Uh, when it, if it's just two, it becomes it can become weird. I mean, Donna and and and, and uh, the Doctor were were good, but other than yeah. that, we got we got it, the it just wants to tend to become some sort of couple. And that well, that, that's modern Who. It wasn't it wasn't that way back in the day. Did uh yeah, well <laughs> certainly I mean, the Sixth Doctor and Perry did, were not a couple. <laughs> no, yeah. not after the strangulation incident. <laughs> but well, even, yeah, I mean, like Doctor with, and Perry, you had Mel in or, the tenth or the Seventh Doctor, Ace in the Seventh Doctor. I, I was just going to mention Ace. Yeah, Ace yeah. and the Seventh Doctor worked brilliantly together. Where and actually, that was that was more of a father daughter exactly. relationship. Okay, yeah. like Bill in the in the Twelfth Doctor, I suppose was a, was similar mm-hmm. in that sense. Yeah. Um, it's really breaking up the the potential romantic interest, I think. And that's one of the things mm-hmm. we talked about um, was to, to avoid the romantic interest, but also to break the mold of the young 20th century British woman who travels with the doctor, which is what we've basically had in New Who. We've really kind of. They got away well, they, from that. It's still 21st that. century British people, but it's yeah. it doesn't have the same feel yeah. anymore. And I, I think that the reason why we might have some critiques about the development of the characters really gets down to the writing. It has nothing to do with the fact there were three companions. Right. It has to do with just who wrote the episodes and the development that they put into the characters between the episodes. Right. Um, I had said that, that we should have the characters, uh, the companions stick around, that they shouldn't just be one and done in a season. And it looks like just kind of looking forward. It looks like it, apparently they're all coming back for the mm-hmm. next season, yep. which I'm I'm happy to see. Um, we all agreed that we should not see Clara and Ashilda again. There's no sense really talking about that because that Ugh. really didn't happen. Especially um, Ashilda. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we decided uh, that we should lower the stakes and the scope of the stories. It shouldn't be that the was, Doctor astride yeah. the universe saving ev- all of creation. By and large, they, they did, did that. that. By and large, by and large. So, so that those were our uh, bits of advice. I think you know we had some hits and misses on that, but I think in general they kind of hit our advice that we gave them. There's some areas where mm-hmm. we where I think they could have done better, uh, but mm-hmm. in general that was it, it, they really stuck to to what we thought we, we should do. Hi, folks. This is Don Bettinelli jumping in here. Our discussion of Series 11 of Doctor Who went well beyond our normal show length, and so Jimmy, Father Corey, and I decided that rather than cut the conversation short, we would cut it in half and make it two episodes. So we're ending Part 1 here, and next week we'll conclude with Part 2, where we'll discuss the ranking of the episodes, Jodie Whittaker and the Companions, the U.S. and British ratings this season compared to other seasons, and what we can expect next season. 
We hope you'll join us. Let us know what you thought of the first part of our discussion by visiting sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page and leaving us some feedback, or send us an email to doctorwho at sqpn.com. You can find links to our show notes on sqpn.com. And until next time, I want to thank Jimmy Aiken and Father Corey Stika for joining me in sharing The Secrets of Doctor Who. And once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. Right. This is going to be fun.